Does. Well, good morning. morning. How y'all doing this morning? Great. All right. Wonderful. Good. Good. I have. Uh, I've. I've already exhausted. I've got two cups here. I've already exhausted one. I'm on the second one. Uh -oh, I, just good. Finished, I, I just finished. I, I did not. Yeah, we bought Mike. You should have bought that cup you found the other day. I only, I I'm down to one cup a day. That was like <laughs> forty ounces or something, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, I, uh, I, I neglected to fix me a little bit of coffee this morning. I, I don't know. My, my morning was a little discombobulated, ran over here, didn't have anything, ran back, pulled something out of the fridge and I've got this, which That's I right. hardly ever drink, but it's, uh, well, it's, it's bubbly decap, and it's, yeah. uh, it's waking the throat up. So I, I just yep. grabbed it. So, uh, anyway, yeah. we'll, 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 we'll see how, how I'll do there. So after we get done, I've got to go, you know, get, get my cup of Joe and sure. get, get going with everything. But, uh, but it's good sure. to see you all and, uh, and looking forward to, uh, to the time we have together. We have a lot to talk about, a lot of deep things to talk about. So once again, it seems like we're only going to be able to, uh, to just skim the surface of this, but, uh, but we do want to bring it up. And again, uh, want to encourage everyone as we go through this, uh, we're going through Joel Beakey's, uh, reform systematic theology. Uh, it's a projected four volume set. Uh, three of the volumes have already been published. Uh, the fourth and final volume is, is yet to be released. I think it's going to be released around, um, June of this year, I believe. And, uh, and so we are slowly making our way through it. So uh, we would encourage you all uh, pick up the book, uh, pick up right along with us. And, uh, and uh, for the little bit that we have the time to touch on, that'll be familiar to you, but there's so much more here. And we just encourage you to, uh, to uh, join with us. Uh, Tola Lege, right, Marvin? Pick up and totally read. Lege. Right? Oh yeah, That's actually <laughs> here it is. I got bookmark. Totally like it. Oh, look at it. He's <laughs> represented today. <laughs> yeah. No, this is actually uh this is actually Joel Beakey's uh the, the uh, bookmark I got in one of my shipments. So uh, mm. much appreciated. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right, well, brothers, I am I'm about to open this book. And, and every time I open this book, I lose a little bit of my soul because something always creaks and cracks and pops. Oh, and I'm I know. thinking, what, what, what is this? Is this like Too a, much the stone binding? No, I'm brother, just it's a weighty about one day pages are going to fly out everywhere. Well, yeah. it will. I'm telling you that this is, <laughs> it's hard to, it's hard to bind well a, a volume this big, uh, but it is a weighty volume. And, <laughs> and what you're discovering is that it creaks under the weight. Yeah, and then, and then you get to the part where where you come like to the end of one of the uh you know the the, the signatures you know how they bind books you got the the folded pages and 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 each set of those is called a signature and you get to one of them and it's like the the glue's almost coming apart and and I'm like oh I just oh yeah, yeah. Me to, to see no, that you know? well just, just just resolve itself to yourself brother uh, just uh, re just rejoice <laughs> exactly. in, just just, just yeah. rejoice in, rejoice in the providence I mean your your book's gonna fall apart. <laughs> there we go thank you just, just accept it you won't have accept any problem it. right that's yeah. right all right well let's let's go ahead and get into uh this today we want to look at uh uh three chapters today and uh we want to two of them deal with god's moral excellence and <clears throat> there are, are are sub sections to each one and specifically within the overall subject of god's moral excellence we want to look at jealousy we want to look at impassibility we want to look at joy we want to look at wrath and we want to look at compassion. And there's some really, really good questions that are embedded in, in those yeah. in that how do we hold to these doctrines in a biblical way? And yet, how are they balanced out with practical questions that we would have? And then also the, the third major thing we want to talk about is we want to talk about the Trinity and uh, Joel Beakey has it divided up into, into a different part, uh, different chapters. And so the first chapter, part one is talking about the, uh, the biblical teaching of the Trinity. So we want to just touch on that. And again, mm -hmm. just by those titles, you see, these are all very, very deep issues. And again, we're not going to be able to do that justice, but we do want to bring up a few things as we talk about these. So, uh, so why don't we go ahead and do that? Why don't we just sort of do it as just a, a free for all this morning? Let's just start off with the first section, jealousy, impassibility, and joy. And brothers, I'll just toss that out to you and we can take it up uh, wherever we want to take it up and, uh, and just begin looking at it. 
Okay. Um, I think he really kicks it off quite well on, on page 830 when the, uh, the bold-faced uh, title of the section, God's Jealousy, the Infinite Intensity of Divine Aff Affection. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's the way he phrases it. And one thing I've noticed through all of this, um, and, and this was very helpful in many regards, um, but this uh, this uh, this word infinite is just valuable to this because, again, it helps us to delineate. And I know he's always trying to steer us between the shores of one of saying, you know, God has no, has God has no feelings. His reactions to us are not real. You know, they're not in the mm -hmm. sense that we would in a sense, God, <clears throat> on the other sense, the, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the side of David Griffin and uh, Cobb and the uh, process theologians mm -hmm. and God is not only is with us, but he's being made up by this and he actually is learning and being enriched by our experiences. So he tries to steer middle course with that. I think the way he does that is to, again, again and again, again uh, he emphasizes infinite. That is that we're talking about an infinite God who is, who created time, who's not bound by time, but yet nevertheless, who is interacting with us in time. Uh, how does he do that in a way that we can describe? Uh, mm -hmm. Because again, eternity is not, a, is a concept that's not innate to us. Uh, um uh, I don't, I don't know that uh, Adam and Eve really understood eternity either. I mean, it was just a day-to-day -day existence for them. And if they had, as we know, if they in the covenant of works, if they would passed that probation period, they would have, they would have lived forever, and they right. would have uh, dwelled in the in the garden, and they would have enjoyed God with an immediate presence that only we'll know in heaven. But I think it's important that we understand that God is outside time, mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. there's the struggle. There is trying to say. How can a God who is outside of time interact with us in a meaningful way when we are bound by time? Um, how can he how can he relate to us in that uh, since he is not time bound? Um, and I think Beaky does a marvelous, marvelous job of doing that. Uh, and as we get into this, um, and, and I'll go ahead and make the point now, we might elaborate it further. I, uh, I, I picked up the subtext of this and I, I can't remember what page it's on now. Uh, but I think that we often say that the language reflecting this is anthropomorphic and we've used that mm -hmm. term a lot. And those of you that listen to the podcast, all five of you, and I'm looking right at you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, again, that just means it's a, uh, uh, it's it, it has the word just literally is in a human form, and, and it's just uh, it's just a an analogical way for us to talk about God. But the point that Beaky is making in here uh, is it is that, uh, but there's also within that in terms of an anticipation of the um, um, uh, the infinite uh, intense uh, God and intense mm -hmm. in the fervent way, uh, the infinite intense God actually interacts acting with us and, and us and us responding to that. But it is not only in an anthropomorphic way for our understanding, but it is in a sense eschatological as well yeah. uh, because it anticipates Christ. It anticipates Christ. And it really, it, it's like, uh, it's like if, if God were writing a novel uh, and in a sense by the Holy spirit, that really is what we have. We have a clear, a collection of 66 books that cohere wonderfully together, even though that, uh, many of them have separate authors. Uh, but, but in that, uh, in, in that uh, we see that there are, as we would say in a suspense novel, that there are cliffhangers along the way and uh, wherever it is that, and particularly in the, in the uh, passages that, that Beaky is drawing our attention to, there's always this thing where we see God, um, in, in the passion of his love in the, uh, or in the, uh, and I, that's another thing I want to talk about probably later is the, is the distinction between passion and affection, but, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but, but talking about that in a way, uh, that looks at and describes their immediate experience of that, but also drops the hint, uh, in an escot in an eschatological way, uh, that this is going to be resolved at a later time, that, that the infinite God, uh, who is outside of time at this point, nevertheless, and by, by divine role, uh, by divine equality, 
and as he says in the chapter on the Trinity, Trinity by perichoresis, uh, that he is a God actually uh, who is uh, who is fully aware of that, but yet has not really come in a way uh, to explain that to us. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's where the beauty of John 1 is, uh, is John John gets that. And he says, uh, he, he is the, he's the full revelation of God. All these things we have questions about in terms of, in terms of uh, the intensity of his love, of his wrath, of all these things, uh, these are things that are fully resolved in Christ, uh, who uh, fully has a divine nature, but at the same time has a human nature which is mutable. I think mm-hmm. it's important for us to say that Christ, uh, that Christ's nature is mutable in the sense that ours is, except right. as the Christ writer of Hebrews says. Humanity. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, as the writer of Hebrews says uh, that he learned that he learned obedience by his sufferings. Mm-hmm. So in other words, there was a learning process. Uh, the Gospels say, I believe it's Luke that says uh, he grew in stature and favor and and uh, and stature and wisdom and in favor with God and man. So there's a normal developmental process that we see there that mm-hmm. relates to us, but at the same time also realizing that this is the eternal God. Um, uh, who, who from eternity it has been the eternal son of God who has made various uh, appearances in, um, in, in, uh, uh, in certain epiphanies and, and things uh, kind of, again, kind of a, a clue of things to come. Uh, but again, he's fully here, and a lot of these are resolved. And as I was reading these chapters, and I know you brothers were as well, uh, it, there was always in the back, background in your mind, I says, the Trinity, the Trinity is is the Trinity is where we settle a lot of these things. Yeah. Uh, in terms of God's one nature, how it is that how it is that He He perfectly, intensely, and fervently, uh, how He actually manifests that that in this world, uh, and how He does so in accordance with His divine nature. Uh, so, I mean, I I just think this is really rich, and that's one of the things I picked up from it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Let, let me do this, and then, Mike, I want to toss it over to you because uh, a lot of this, I think, folds over on impassibility because yep. when we're looking at the three things that we're looking at, we're looking at jealousy, impassibility, and joy. And and you might say, okay, well, how how is God provoked from the outside toward jealousy? How is God provoked from the outside toward joy? And that would be a, a wrong way to think about that, because if he is provoked from the outside to these things, okay. then he can't be impassable. So how is he impassable? But yet at the same time, he has jealousy. At the same time, he has joy. And what I want to do is I just want to read what Beaky has to say about it, because I think he lays it down really really well uh just like Beaky does so many other things and then uh and then we can go off of that because i think this is just very important to kind of settle and he and he takes the bull by the horns here so beginning on the bottom of page 832 he says if we make an unqualified statement that yes god has affections then we may give the impression that people have power to disturb god to make him happier than he was or even to provoke him to do something he might regret Such a God would not be the immutable rock made known in scripture, but as unstable as water, someone on whom we could not depend. If we say no without further qualification, then we may give the impression that God is cold, remote, uncaring, and nothing like the God of the Bible. Even if our intent is to sustain the doctrine of God's immutability, we could undermine his love and personality. Then he goes on to say in the next paragraph, Our talk about God is neither univocal, meaning the same for him as it does for us, nor equivocal, meaning something completely different. It is analogical language. And again, we've seen that a few times already in describing God. Oh, I think that's so important. Yeah. It is analogical language, meaning something similar, but not identical. We cannot answer the question, does God have affections with an unqualified yes or no? Because the personal life of the infinite, eternal, unchangeable Lord has some points of resemblance to the emotions of the human Im- his human image bears, but it transcends them. There are significant ways in which the living God is not like human beings, for he, he is the creator, Acts 14, 15. This problem is not unique to divine affections. And in the last sentence of that paragraph, all talk about God must involve a balance of yes and no, while carefully avoiding logical contradictions that would make theology nonsense and God untrue. 
So, Mike, brother, what what are your observations or your keen takeaways uh, in in e- any of these aspects, jealousy and passibility or joy? Okay. You see, as I was reading, reviewing this morning, I was trying to, you know, highlight uh, highlight my highlights that I wanted uh-huh. to touch <laughs> and then kind of writing some things down. And just uh, when I look at the, you know, the doctor, Doctrine of his uh, divine jealousy, or you know, I say, well, what is the basis for all this? And the and the basis for this, what from my reading and I, that I uh, assumed uh, that the basis for all this is God's doing it for His glory, His honor, for the manifestation of of His Son uh, Jesus Christ, and uh, and for the and showing the re- the redemption. I mean, uh, the, the, the the of the of people who will. Uh, who will return his zealness uh, for his zealness, his love. I like the word he used. He used ardent. And, uh, yeah. and then uh, as far as the, the, uh, the uh, infinite uh, timeless, you know, that Marvin hit on earlier. Uh, I also thought, and I think he mentioned that too, uh, just he, uh, you know, God transcends time. I mean, he's, he's throughout everything. Uh, uh, he's always there. It's, it's always there. It's like, a, it's, um, Oh, well, you know, uh, supernatural. I mean, it's, it's, he, he transcends time. He's, he, he's not restricted by any boundaries and the feelings that we as humans, uh, feel the emotions we have are not, not the same as the emotions that God has. Uh, that, that was a, a key point he brought up on all of these emotions, the, the jealousy, the joy, the affections. Um, so, uh, uh, as far as on the pa- passability, you know, does, you know, the question he posed in his, in his uh, chapter is, does, does God have affections? And, and uh, he said that that, uh, that that is like a golden thread through the tapestry of the Christian tradition about uh, does God have affections? Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I guess that in, in summary, you know, he came to the conclusion, uh, God's affections do not depend upon our ch- change with his um with his creatures but are facts of his eternal immutable essence that is that is not greek philosophy but uh, bible doctrine of god uh, his aspect of biblical distinction between the eternal creator and his creatures that guards his uh, divine transcendence so how he responds and those those difference between uh, how his cre- you know the creator creature and, and he brings that up in here he said, when we look at this topic, whether we're looking at these emotions, these affections, you know, the joy, the 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 uh, jealousy, uh, the anger, I guess, you know, the, the passion can, that can turn into sinful, uh, uh, sinful anger, uh, all all this, it's 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 the basis. God, we we got to remember that we're the image bearers of Christ, but we're not we're not we're not uh, image bearers of God. We're we are not God. He is the Creator. We are the creatures, and how we respond is is much 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 more. I guess the word I would use is um, not it not 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 what how God responds. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I since we're created as image, we do have I guess a small. Uh, he indicated we we have imprinted in us the affections that that God has, but they're not the same. Ours are s- yeah. much much smaller, finite than the emotions that God has. Yeah, yeah. And, and I will get to that term we talked about, analogical. That uh, yeah, right. That there is a a correlation, but there's an infinite difference as well. Yeah, and that uh, you see what I, on, on joy, uh, just that his 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 joy means. Uh, He's complete. Uh, the, 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 I guess the Greek that's used there, uh, the joy that they refer to in God is his essence. He is fully complete. He need, nothing that we can do or nothing that we uh, uh, man does, his creatures does, can, 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 um, can increase uh, or add to or build, build more into his joy. He, the, the word that's phrased and used with the, on God and joy is that uh, he is complete. There's nothing that we as his creatures can add. He wants to see us uh, uh, in, in joyful obedience. He wants to see us growing and, and, and having the same, the, the, the zeal, uh, the love and joy he has for us. He wants that returned in our service to him. He wants to see a joyful, loving service. And I, and I love the, the scripture that he, um, he brought up in that aspect. And for in Titus, 
Titus uh, chapter two, verse, uh, I'll start at verse 12 uh, uh, or 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. I think that was key. I mean, what God is doing in all this and, and the difference he has is he, it's for the building us up. I mean, we, we've talked about that in, in our sermons and in our readings, but for us to, re, to return that, that zealness, that joy, that love, um, and yes, we, 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 we are subject to his anger uh, uh, when we sin, because when we sin, we, we're not considering the great, you know, the, 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 the divine God. When man sins, I mean, when we sin, we're, we're, when people sin, they're not thinking about God, they're thinking about themselves. So they kind of suppress uh, the, the divine God, the, 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 their, their creator, why they're sinning, it's suppressed. But then, you know, they, they do, there is the repentance of the sin and confession of the sin, but uh, we're, we're different. And God wants us to return the same zeal, not the same, but the zeal he has for his creatures and creation. He's looking for a ret return. He does what he does for our good, for his glory uh, and, 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 the, and, the manif and, and the glory of his son, Christ. So I guess that's what I have on those first couple of uh, topics dealing with his uh, affections, his emotion, his jealousy, his joy. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Uh, one of the things I wanted to talk about was, um, was, and you touched on it, Mike, uh, passions and affections. Yeah. And, and, I think and, that's and, important. Yeah. And I like what Beaky says. He addresses yep. that because he first comes out and says, you know, how, how, yeah. yeah, how can we even make a, a difference between these two? They're, they're almost synonymous. Yes. And, um, uh, I like how he explains it, uh, starting at the top of, uh, 840 uh he says if affection is taken in the sense of human passion then we cannot affirm it of god without denying his simplicity immutability and blessedness in other words if god is a god of passion and we need to understand there's a historical way that passions were used in our day and age uh passion is you know unless it's like lustful passion or things like that people don't normally make a, a negative connotation about it you know i'm, I'm passionate for the Alabama Crimson Tide, you know, no one would, would say, uh, what I, pa you have passion, that's bad. But, uh, but really it, the, uh, the, the history of the word is, it's not a good thing that you're, you, you have these things that are outside of you that move you to this or to this or to this. And that was not generally known as a, as a really good thing. And so Beaky's making the distinction here. So again, he says, if affection is taken in the sense of human passion, then we cannot affirm it of God without denying his simplicity, immutability, and blessedness. Yet it is possible to speak of analogical affections. And again, that's that word, uh, the analogy, right? Analogical, analogical affections that point to a transcendent perfection in God. Though passion and affection can be used synonymously, it is possible to distinguish them as passive and active. Passions are the inner reactions of a person originating from outside influences, but affections may originate in the person's own will to influence others. In other words, it's coming from the inside going out. When theologians say that God is unaffected, quote, by the world, they do not mean that he is indifferent to it. But if we if we may think of effect as a line of influence, but that the direction of his affection flows from his eternal will outward to change the world, not from the world to change him. So again, yeah. the difference between passion and effect, passions are coming in, passions are outside of of me, and and I'm and they're coming, they're they're facing me, they're interacting with me, and now I have a reaction to it. Whereas with God. His his affections, his perfections, they they're they're a decree of his will, and because his will is unchanging, his passions never change. And so, I mean, his not his passions. See, I said the wrong word. His affections no. never change. So uh, so that's why he is immutable. Right, and that's that's the word as we know that Jonathan Edwards prefers to use as affections as well. Mm -hmm. uh, not only in terms of talking about God, but in talking about us as well. Uh, in evaluating the uh, First Great Awakening, uh, 
uh, he has several titles, religious affections. And what he's talking about is that uh, is the evaluation of an action by the condition of the one having it. It's as you said, Van. It's an outward. It's an outward flow. Okay. Uh, passions, as you said, basically would uh, uh, pa uh, passions would suggest uh, that it is a uh, uh, that it is a change that is conditioned by other changes, but which in itself is going to is going to uh, condition other changes. In other words, it's kind of in a cause and effect chain there, uh, whereas it's time bound. Uh, and it's 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 difficult for us to understand that because of God is because that is the way we are. Uh, affections, however, talks about in its best sense, and uh, uh, that and again I'm I'm going back to uh, eight thirty nine, um, uh, in the uh, second to the last paragraph. He says, similarly, uh, what he talks about, Augustine said, since these affections, affectionis, when they are exercised in a becoming way, follow the guidance of right reason, who will dare to say that they are diseases or vicious passions. He says, similarly, Jonathan Edwards, while acknowledging that the meaning of words is a considerable measure loose and unfixed. And I think that's an important point. Understood affections as vigorously lively actings uh, of the will or inclination. In other words, as Van, as you said, they come from the outside and they disclose the internal state. Uh, they say nothing about what causes them, but uh, about but they are they are the effects of an internal state. Uh, as distinct from passions, he says, which are more violent affections that tend to overpower the mind. He says, for this reason, we can deny passions in God, but affirm affections without contradicting ourselves. And I think that's it. And again, I mean, as I was reading this. Uh, and I mentioned this in uh, briefly in Sunday school yesterday. Um, there is this uh, extended uh, extended uh, meeting session in uh, at Asbury College in in uh, in, in Kentucky, mm -hmm. uh, where by previous measures it appears there's a there's a, a breaking out of revival. Well, uh, I read something this morning that said that. Uh, uh, like a parasitic leech, Todd Bentley is uh, uh, is descending on it and wants to attach himself to it and says he's been invited when indeed he has not been invited to this. Uh, but again, uh, Edward would talk about affections in that sense, and he measures that in terms of what are uh, – uh, by your actions, you say what is at the heart of this motivation – and it, it also demonstrates what you value and what you love in this as well. And, and that's why he was always, always so careful in evaluating that. Um, and he was willing to bear the arrows of those who say, well, who are you to criticize somebody's experience? You can have all the experiences you want to, but whenever you're talking about a movement of God, we need to understand that it is analogical, uh, but that we do talk about it in terms of uh, the the proper way to talk about it for ourselves and for God as well is to talk about affections uh, and, and to and to talk about the fact that this is really what is dispositive or dis, or discloses um, mm -hmm. uh, of of the uh, of the internal state of God itself. And I think it's a better better way of saying that the internal state um, because it it's it suggests something in God anyway that is permanent. Uh, but which is accommodating to us. And again, it's so important that uh, univocal, equivocal, analogical, the, the analogical state of where God is in this in relationship, in relationship to us. And, and how does that affect us? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and how does it, how does it feed that particular understanding in that, in that particular state we have uh, um and direct and direct our actions outward and towards God in such a way that they are reflective of God, I think. So, I mean, I, uh, Van, I agree with you. Blast on, I think, to really the heart of it here. And uh, he consistently, Beaky consistently uses this word affections to move on. And I think that even though it is not completely free of the misunderstandings there, I think it is a better word to use really to kind of move us beyond that and to elevate it to a point to where we talk about, we talk about God and to talk about his actions, and his thoughts towards us in that way. And it does involve, it does avoid some of the problems I think of, of talking about passions. 
And it's a better way, I think, to engage in this uh, in this discussion of impassibility, I think. Right, right. Well, let's move on to wrath and compassion. And there's so much more we yeah. could say. And we didn't right. get into some of the <clears throat> some of the thorny issues like scholasticism, right. Hellenism, in other words, you know, how uh, the charge of incorporating, you know, uh, rational thinking, logic, uh, uh, Hellenism just means basically anything Greek, Greek culture, Greek lifestyle, Greek ideology, and how all that has come into our formation of the doctrine of God, especially regarding these issues of impassibility. But but we're going to have to leave that for a later time. So let's move on to this. And, and uh, uh, Marvin, I'd ask you first if you would just uh, speak to the issue of wrath. And then, Mike, if you would speak to the issue of compassion. And and as these relate to impassibility, th- 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 they're different uh, they're different things in and of themselves. You know, they're not jealousy. They're not joy. But yet they right. relate to impassibility right. in the same way. And right. I kind of want to just kick it off uh, by just reading what Beaky said about anger, because I, I think this is very, very good. And then Marvin, I'll toss it to you to speak more about anger. And then Mike, we can go to you to speak more about compassion and how these things relate to <clears throat> to impassibility. But just two things real quick on page 854 and then the other one on page 855, but 854 the middle of the page, he says, strictly speaking, wrath is not an attribute of God's nature, but is his holy justice against sin. God does not enjoy afflicting and destroying his creatures, but rejoices in his righteousness and justice when he executes the law's curse upon sinners. And then going to the next page over 855, in the middle of that page, he says, in the same way, we argue that God's grieving in this text, and he's talking about if he, uh, Isaiah chapter 63, verse 10. Uh, uh, no, uh, sorry, Ephesians 4.30, uh, gr- the grieving of the Holy Spirit. In the same way, we argue that God's grieving in this text indicates anger, but not sorrow, which would be inconsistent with his blessedness. Jonathan Edwards said, if God's infinite hatred against sin included, quote, pain and grief, over each sin, then countless sins committed by demons and men would cause God to, quote, suffer infinite pain every day, end quote, and make him, quote, the most miserable of all beings, end quote. Whereas in truth, God is, quote, perfectly happy for he sovereignly uses the evil of sin for his glory. So he's talking about wrath there, Marvin, and he's talking about you know, God is not being batted from pillar to post because of your sin and my sin. And he's just reacting to this and grieved over it. And and like Edward says, the most miserable uh, creature, although he's not a creature, but uh, the most miserable being in all of existence, uh, he's not that. Uh, so why is he not that? Yeah, those are actually the two quotes I was going to bring out as oh, well. Sorry I, about that. No, that's all right. That's all right. Uh, there are other things to talk about here, uh, but I, I do, I do think they are good in the sense that as they talk about wrath, uh, it is important as as he says here, uh, and this is somewhere where I had to rethink my my way of doing this as well. Uh, because wrath is not an attribute of God. I find myself sometimes when I'm talking about the attributes of God, actually slipping wrath in as an, as an attribute of God. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll do that too. I interchange yeah. justice and wrath. You know? Right, right. And I, and he, he's made a good point and I'm, I'm more careful about that now really to talk about justice and to talk about wrath as an expression of justice. Mm-hmm. Um, and also the, again, we were talking about internal states and affections. Uh, again, I mean, this is where the 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 uh, uh, the choppy waters are in this, in the fact that, in terms of all the all the analogical descriptions we can make of God in terms of His wrath, I mean, this is the one that is hardest for us to relate to, um, in terms of uh, His righteous, settled opposition to sin mm-hmm. in, in whatever regard. And to understand there that at the one time, uh, it, that on the one hand, it is impersonal uh, in the sense that it is an expression of his divine justice. Um, and again, there is this um, idea of the infinite of the infinite offense against his right uh, against his divine justice. Uh, and again, this is a discussion for another time, but this is where I, I think that uh, 
uh, Jonathan Edwards and I think Andrew F Fuller, uh, one of our uh, English particular Baptist forebears, who's uh, great, vastly underappreciated, I think. Um, and also James uh, 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 James Pettigrew Boyce, the, the founder mm -hmm. of Southern Seminary. All three of these talk about the atonement in this category as well, in terms of uh, in terms of whatever atonement have to be made is an inf is a set is an infinite satisfaction to the justice of God. And I think I think that I think that lends uh, uh, an interpretive lens to this as well. When we understand, as we started out this discussion by saying, infinite is always in view here, and infinite doesn't have to mean impersonal. Uh, on the one hand, I said it, it 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 can be impersonal in the sense that it's God settled opposition to unrighteousness, but on the other hand, it is personal as well, uh, is because uh, in a covenant relationship. Uh, wrath is not, wrath is not always, uh, God's first and, and last reaction to sin and to unrighteousness. I think this is where wrath and forbearance, wrath and patience are just so, are just so wrapped up with each other, uh, in terms of talking about the nature of God. Uh, we, we see in second Peter, Peter talks about the scoffing of those who say, well, where's the, where's the, where's the problem? Where's the, where's the promise of his appearance or where's the promise of his coming? Um, and, uh, in terms of, uh, kind of a one-to-one, -one, uh, breakdown, a correlation between, uh, actions of injustice or violations of God's righteous nature and God's righteous law against him. Uh, looking for an immediate, looking for an immediate punishment, as if that's the only way really to display that or to interpret that is a one-to-one -one kind of relationship there. Uh, whereas God's uh, God's forbearance and His patience there, and coupled with justice in that, uh, says that uh, that He can be that He can be wrathful, uh, but He can also be but He can also be loving. Uh, in that sense, then the two, the two, uh, the two, well, at love is an attribute, but the two of those together are not contradictory in the sense that, that, that the forbearance or the delaying of his wrath is for a purpose. Mm -hmm. It is for a higher purpose that God has in mind that is not temporally bound. Again, as we were saying, it's in a sense eschatological in the sense that he, he puts this off for a while. The greatest example, I think, in the New Testament is the second coming of Christ. And again, as I said, Peter talks addresses this in his second letter to the scoffers, and uh, in a, in a sense of trying to talk about God's wrath in that sense, uh, in a temporal sense. And uh, ultimately, Peter resolves it by saying, you know, God doesn't measure time like we do. Uh, a, a, a brief moment is a thousand is a thousand years in, in God's sight. So, in terms of uh, in terms of trying to measure when's the promise of his coming, or as the disciples did, as they saw on the uh, Mount Olivet, Mount Olivet, as they saw him ascending back into heaven, is this the time you restore the kingdom of Israel? And, and essentially, Jesus tells them at that point, okay, you don't worry about the time. Again, there's the infinite nature of this. This resolves with the Father, and the Father is carrying this out. And my work, having done this and being ascended back into heaven, is the forbearance of God in not bringing wrath. One day wrath will come. And mm -hmm. if it did not, he would not be God. And if he did not, every promise that he makes to us would be invalid. Uh, because again, he promises us that we're going to live in a world that is free from sin and unrighteousness. Uh, if we have a mixture of sheep and goats in the flock, then how is that heaven? Or where is justice in that? And that, again, I mean, I think that's where we get muddled with our friends and talking about God's justice. And, and I have a friend that says, uh, that says, well, you're a hellfire and uh, you're a hellfire and brimstone preacher. I says, well, I, well, I have to, I am. <laughs> uh, but again, I, 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 I do say that and it ultimately I land on that, but I also emphasize uh, in a practical sense uh, the patience of God in this, in the sense that it is the grounds, uh, as Peter says again in Second Peter, God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Uh, now, again, I mean, there's a uh, there's some there's some interpretive key, uh, uh, issues in, in, in that as well. It's not a uh, 
and I, Van, I think you were saying this as well in, in the introductory thing, uh, there's not this, this thing there where uh, God is willing in the sense that all men repent. He is that. Because again, I mean, it's a reflection of his of his righteous and divine nature. He created us in righteousness. He created us for holiness. Um, and in that sense, then it does not please him uh, that we do not repent. It actually, in that sense, in a in a passable way, grieves his heart that we do not repent. Uh, but but um, but by the same token, uh, uh, it, it is uh, it is one of the solid basis of gospel crop proclamation that we do is on the one hand, we can say God's justice will be satisfied. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, you see that picture in the cross. You see that picture in the resurrection and the ascension. You see that reflected in the early preaching of the church. You see all that reflected in the fact, uh, and the fact that he has not come to judge sin yet is, is an encouragement for you is an is an encouragement for you to repent because God has opened up the the gospel promise there that those who will repent and come to him will be saved. Hmm. Um, and again, this is a, apart from any discussion we have about the freedom of the will or whatever. And I don't think that particular passage deals with that as, as our Armenian friends believe it does. Uh, but it is talking more about the nature and the character of God in that, in the sense that that's the way that wrath is disclosed. It's disclosed eschatologically. It's disclosed in time. It's not a one-to-one -one relationship uh, like your mother or your father standing over you. And uh, whenever you reach out to grab a, a burning stove, slapping your hand and moving it away, uh, then obligating them to follow you all around the house and to slap your hand or to do whatever they can to keep you from any harm. There's a certain trust they have in letting you roam like that. Uh, but again, it's a, it's a trust of instruction. It's a trust in that case of, of, of having taught you that, uh, of that being revealed to you, if you want to use that in, in, a, in a loose analogical way. So it is with God as well. Uh, he entrusts us with the law. He entrusts us with his word at that point. And, and again, rather than going and slapping our hand every time we touch the wrong thing, uh, again, that is where, and we get over into the chapter on the Trinity, that's where the Holy Spirit as the spirit of God and the spirit of the son, uh, that's where he is so valuable because he slaps the hand, but he doesn't do it in a temporal way. Uh, again, that is the beauty of the new covenant in the sense that, uh, and it's the beauty of Jeremiah and Ezekiel when he says, God will write the law in your heart. Mm. And it's not tablets of stone anymore. In other words, uh, you, you, uh, no man will have, uh, will have uh, need of another man to teach him. This will be God taught. So in that sense, then I think wrath is understand, understood. Uh, I think it, it's a it, not to dis, not to discount that it is a, a particularly thorny issue, and particularly when you're talking about the impassibility of God. But Van, as you've been going through your sermon series the last couple of Sundays, it, it we were talking about this before we started. Uh, it is reflective of the difficulty that we have with this of trying to find that balance. I mean. Uh, Paul definitely in Ephesians four says anger is a proper response, but, mm -hmm. but within what, but within what boundaries is it is? Well, the boundaries there are God's word and the boundaries are, there are the sanctifying work of the spirit. Those are the two guardrails there, uh, mm -hmm. where God is, where God is keeping us, where God is keeping us from harm and keeping us from the natural consequences of unrighteousness and of violating his, uh, and, and, and of violating his, his righteous law. And in that sense, then, I mean, it's, a uh, jumping over to the end of the chapter where, uh, uh, where, uh, Beaky talks about the practical implications of this, but it fills us with joy is to know that God takes that immediate, uh, that immediate, uh, attention of that, uh, personal to, and this is where it's personal to us personal to each and every one of us in the sense that it's not just a group guidance, but it's a personal guidance. Uh, and, and unlike a teacher who has 30 people in their classroom trying to keep up with all of them, God, by the Holy Spirit and by the sovereign, by the sovereign election and work of Christ, in, in both of those cases, God is keeping up, up with us in a way and guiding us in that and knowing us better than we know ourselves and being a teacher by the spirit and by the word in order to, in order to do these things. So I, I guess in the end, I think wrath is a difficult concept for us to, to, 
to grab around. Uh, but then again, trying to build into that the patience of God seems in a, in a way to muddle it. But at the other time, in the other sense, I think it actually helps us to resolve it in the sense that God has given us a promise. Yet, yeah, uh, injustice and, ra- and and sin will be judged. But there is a day of reckoning for this. But until that day, uh, both uh, for unbelievers, it's a time for repentance. For believers, it's also a time for repentance as well. And to know uh, that the God who has set that day of justice in which uh, in which Christ will return uh, and will judge the earth and will gather his own people into uh, unto himself uh, to to build a, a righteous and perfect new heavens and new earth. It, it is a promise for them. It's a warning for the unbeliever, a promise for the other. Uh, and it is uh, and it is uh, foolish there really uh, uh, to try to mistake it one way or another as if God is indifferent to this. No, the cross says, and Jesus says is extremely, uh, is the opposite of indifferent to this, to, to this. It, it is, it, it is his work, which really, which really burns us into our hearts and make this a reality. I think as we watch, uh, the work of Christ against, against injustice and unrighteousness and in his patience, uh, in bringing us to himself and his patience with us by a spirit of sanctifying us as well. Um, and that's the way I would, I would see wrath, uh, uh, in terms of trying to reconcile that with God. I mean, as, as we said earlier, uh, uh, all these things beg us to go to the Trinity and the, it's, the end of our study is that in which it is much easier. I think as Christ exegetes this, as John, as John one says, he, uh, uh, John literally says the, 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 the son, Jesus exegetes the father for us. In other words, mm-hmm. he draws him, draws him out or explains him to us i think we're on sounder grounds really to to lean on that very good brother thank you and uh and beaky says this he says uh therefore divine wrath is immutable in the sense that it expresses the attitude of god's unchanging holiness toward all that contradicts it god's wrath is not merely a negative effect of sin right but the personal opposition of god against sinners and then he goes on to say, God's Im- immutability does not mean immobility. Right. And his immutability is not immobility. He is a living God, a pure act of personal life in eternal, infinite motion of understanding and love. We can consider divine anger to be a motion without contradicting the immutability of divine affection so long as that emotion is not viewed as temporal but as the eternal act of God's will to glorify his holiness. This one simple eternal act of the divine holiness relates to different people at different points in history in distinct ways. Towards some, it is the motion of wrath. And that's exactly what you were saying, that that as we come under, as we sin, as we come under God, that that there's always, uh, you know, to use my bad illustration it's, it's like the these beams are constantly shining down you have the right. beam of god's justice right and if you're uh if you're under sort of the beam of his grace you know you receive his graciousness but as you're an unconverted sinner and you're under the beam of his justice and again this is a bad illustration but what comes out of that justice it is wrath and so for that time that you're there wrath hangs over your head but should yep. by the grace of god you come to know christ as your lord and savior well yep. you're not under that anymore his justice yep. is not displayed toward you it is now his graciousness right and, and that's uh, i that's, i appreciate that and again i think it's also why uh in the new testament uh whenever god talks about in, in his personal way talking about opposition to sin in our lives he doesn't call it wrath he calls it chastisement Mm-hmm. Uh, because again, there's a constructive element to that that is anchored in Christ. So I, I think all that's very good. Excellent. Well, Mike, bring us into compassion, my brother. Okay. Uh, but before I start, I, you know, going through it and just looking through it, uh, thumbing through the uh, pages on this section, I think bottom bottom line is uh, this brings out uh, you can't talk about this without talking about God's love. God's love for His His. Uh, his yep creation his yep. his mm-hmm. his uh, his uh elect um and uh he starts out by god's goodness manifests itself in his mercy to the mis- miserable the word of god teaches us that he is aware of his people's suffering with a compassion that engages him to support and deliver them so 
you know, it, it, he sets the stage. I mean, he, 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 he has that love for him, that compassion for his children. And the, the compassion is, he, he, you know, he has those covenantal relationships. He has covenants out there that he's, he's going to, he's going to, he's not going to break the covenant he makes with his people. So mm-hmm. using his covenant, he, uh, and his, he, he, his compassion reaches out to the elect people before they even turn to him. And right. his purpose in showing his compassion is to show his love, to show his, his essence, to get his people to turn to him in repentance uh, and, 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 uh, and, and, and worship of him is the one true only God recognize him is uh, you, you know, the, the, the God, the God of all gods, their, their uh, father. And he, um, and then, so it gets into um, uh, the uh, compassion, what it requires. Uh, it's like a special kind of affection, but what I want to do is I want to flip on back further into discussion uh, when it talks about uh, the compassion and we've got to understand it. God's not changing. God, you know, we talk about the immutability of God. He's not changing, but it, it, it he's, he's, the, you know, he's, he sees the same throughout time. And it, uh, he, he said, um, people need an unchanging God. And this is at the bottom of page 865, the next last paragraph. People need an unchanging God, not a God who rides a roller coaster of emotions and pain with them, but one who then, whom they can find constant strength, steadiness, and stability. All men seek this immutability um so i mean um for a god to show compassion uh you know it's we 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 need you know it's showing that god is immutable he is not changing he's unchanging god we don't have to worry about our emotions because our emotions again it's the creator creature distinction he is the same we're going up and down and his love, his, his immutable love, his unchanging love, I mean, for us, for his people, based on his covenant he has with us, uh, I think uh, is, is a key point. And, uh, uh, and I, the, the point I made earlier about love, uh, on page 868, there's a, uh, a, a good section that talks about God's love, I believe, uh, that I think sums it up uh, on his compassion. And it's at the at the middle. It starts with Owen said that God has a true delight in His people, which includes not only the outward demonstration of love, so, but the inward affection or joy of heart and expression and intensity. So I, you know, I think that His compassion is based on His love for us. I mean, it goes back in there. I mean, um, uh, if you don't love something, you know, like I, I, this may be too simplistic, but if you don't love somebody or something you're not going to do anything to, to, uh, to reach out to them or to assist them or to love them or to rescue them. But if you love something, you're going to have that desire, that drive that's going to cause you to return the love that, that, that the creator, you know, that the creature, the creator has for the creature. So again, it's uh, God's using his compassion to bring us to him so it's like it gets back to the uh, the the just the discussion we had on uh, the difference between affection and passion. So uh, passion is 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 uh, is our out our outward response. Is that did I get that right? Is something outward that affects yeah. you? Yes, yeah. right. It's, it, it, it's a reflection of the disposition or the heart. Yeah. Now. Yeah. So uh, so. Uh, so God's aff- affection for us causes our passions, our outward expressions to turn to him and love and to return his, the, the, the love he has for us, love to him, zeal for him. And uh, he goes on to say, um, uh, to love in general is an affection of union and nearness. Yet, yet the father's love for his children is a love of bounty, always freely given like a spring of, or fountain of good, where else our answering love is a love of duty. God's love is always uh, antecedent, unconditional, taking the initiative, where else our love is consequence, a response of his love. God's love is constant and immutable, where else our love grows and wanes over time. Even when God's children are sinning, he loves them, though he does not love their sinning. His acts of discipline upon his children, though they may seem to show the change of his affections, all come from his unchangeable love. Uh, so I, again, I think that points out uh, uh, once uh, the, you know the 
his tro- once uh, his creatures respond to him and c- come to him and are his children, um, I don't know. I guess we can get <laughs> but it uses the word uh, discipline. Yep. So, I mean, uh, we don't, I guess we don't fall under God's wrath, wrath anymore. I got to be careful. I say this, but we fall into right. his discipline. His yeah. children. Yes. Yes. Uh, and uh, so I, I mean, I thought I, I, I enjoyed reading uh, this entire section and I did, just to me, it just uh, Beaky does a good job in, of, of edifying the love of God is humility. I mean, and I, I, I hope my, I hope I did the justice to what he's saying on, on his, uh, his compassion. Yeah, I, I think, and I know we're running out of time. One thing on day 64, and I'll say this, no comment. Furthermore, he says, God is free to exercise his love as he chooses. Yeah. Um, and I think that's uh, when, in Exodus, when uh, Moses said to God, show me, show me your glory. Uh, God's response is, I'll, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy and I'll pardon whom I will. Yeah. So. Good, good. Well, uh, I, I want to read an extended section here at the very end, and then we want to go straight to the Trinity, and we're just going to barely touch on that. And probably what we need to do, since he has the Trinity divided into more than one parts, right. is probably take uh, the biblical teaching on the Trinity and bring it into our discussion next time. But we'll go ahead and touch on that, and I'll just ask both of y'all if you would just give uh, any points that you you might want to give in relation to uh to that first chapter on the biblical teaching of the trinity but you know when we talk about god's affections and his impassibility admittedly these are extremely difficult ideas to kind of get your head wrapped around and uh on page 871 beaky actually gives a a, an example of uh what this would look like as it played out that was good yeah, in the life of I thought, someone. I so that was really good. So I want to read this extended section going uh, 871, 872, and then even a paragraph into 873. He says this, <clears throat> The biblical teachings on God's affections are some of the most comforting and helpful in all his word. However, they remain some of the most puzzling. If God's affections are eternal and immutable, then how can God relate affectionately to us in the changes through which we pass in time. And then he goes on to say, consider a woman who lives in unbelief until she is 20 years old, then turns to Christ in true conversion and follows him through many trials and sorrows. God's affections toward her are manifold, wrath prior to conversion, yet love and mercy leading her to conversion, delight in her repentance, compassion at each of her sorrows, fatherly displeasure over her remaining sins and fatherly joy at her sincere though imperfect obedience. In one sense, she has been loved from eternity for God chose her for salvation. On the other hand, she was not justified and personally pleasing to God until he drew her to trust his son. When we multiply this scenario for the billions of people through history, it seems to suggest that God has an incredibly complex emotional life that constantly fluctuates. He may also suggest that God enjoy perfect peace until the creation and fall of his creatures, but his inner life has been changed, even disturbed, and will not settle down until Christ returns. However, when we turn from ourselves to the God whom we have encountered in our studies, we realize that we cannot view him as if he is passing through time day by day as we do. Neither is God divided across the various places of this world. He is entirely present with each person at every point of space and time, and yet he transcends all space and time. And in the bottom of the page, in light of God's simplicity, infinity, eternity, and immutability, We cannot say that his affections toward us in our changing states imply a change in him. However, God does have distinct affections with respect to events at different points in history. His eternity does not hinder him from engaging in personal activity in time or engaging in real relationships with people in time. His immutability does not freeze him in an eternal instant of time but tells us that he is free to be the same God in the midst of all his changing relationships, knowing all people and events that he has ordained 
God has a distinct affectionate attitude toward each one as appropriate to his holy nature. And then he says this, the greatest difficulty arises for us if we try to press into God's inner life as the eternal one and do not revere his incomprehensibility. To a small extent, we can see how God's wrath and compassion harmonize with his love and joy. However, we cannot fully understand the inward personal life of God in his essence. We should not feel ashamed, but glorify his holy name. To comprehend, to comprehend the inner life of God would require us to be God. Our analogical knowledge of God as his image as his images is rich and beautiful, but as limited as our little minds. It is knowledge of the creator adapted to the needs of created or creaturely minds. And then he says this, sound theology requires delicate balance. And to that I say, amen. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's right. And uh, yeah, I, I love that. I love that illustration there of the woman uh, talking about the different stages mm -hmm. in, uh, of life that she goes through in relationship to God. Uh, it, it is a, it is a mutable situation to her. Uh, yeah. Uh, I mean, she's going from stage to stage, or as the psychologist would say, from state to state. I mean, it is a it is a real transition, but it is not a discontinuous transition. Mm -hmm. um, whereas with God, I mean, as we look at that from God's perspective, uh, He's engaging her personally, as we've said at every stage uh, of the at every stage of the way in a personal way, not an impersonal way, uh, n not by not by just an impersonal. Uh, application of his attributes or, or or that, but it is personal in the sense that um, it is it is individualized for her. Uh, uh, not that not that she's carved a separate path from everywhere else, but she has carved the same path we are in Christ. It's just that her walk is different, uh, mm -hmm. and we and we can draw we can draw by analogy. Uh, encouragement and warning from her examples there as well to understand the same God who is walking and sanctifying her is the same one who does with us as well. And again, I give this plug to the church as well, and I'll, I'll be done. Uh, again, on one more reason, reason number 962 <laughs> of, why, of why it is that you ought to go to church, folks. You ought to go to yeah. church. For those five of you, I know they're watching. You do probably go to our church again. Thank you, <laughs> but mm -hmm. uh, uh, but again, I mean, it's the it, it, there's there's where it is, and yeah. again, uh, uh, because again, our lives are volumes, are volumes to each other. I mean, we are the Bible again again says we are to learn from one of those examples. Hebrews eleven makes no sense at all unless you take that principle. That's Why true. is it that they're the heroes of faith? Well, it's because we, we look to their example for yeah. faithfulness and encouragement on our own parts. And again, I love that illustration that he gives there. Okay. Yeah, if I, I, I like the way he ends this, this the chapter uh, on page 873. I mean, what is in describing God's affection, we come to a point where we must humble ourselves, trust his word, and adore his glory as the infinite, eternal, right. eternal changeable, loving, and righteous God. In the end, yep. our highest theology is the learning of children. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I, I, I think our that's a great theology. bottom line. Yeah, I think that's the bottom line of this. And again, it does explain why Jesus, in one of the highest moments, grabs a child, put him on his lap, and says, unless you come like him, uh-uh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, brothers, uh, our time is fastly winding down. So just a, a brief word, comment from both of you on uh the the chapter and again we'll, we'll probably pull some of this into our next discussion when we talk more about the trinity but uh the trinity biblical teaching that's the name of the chapter there so uh mike why don't we start with you and then we'll slide over to marv and and uh and uh see what insights you guys both kind of pulled out of this chapter just just a couple of main uh punches here that, that, okay. that really stood out to you sure okay uh, real quick um, in summary uh, the the thing i like uh, about this that brought out is uh, the trinity how there's there's uh you know one god but in in, in three persons mm -hmm. and how he went through and identified the work of the three persons not competing against each other but complementing each other uh for one one purpose and one one the glory of god and and I, 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 what what he introduced that I had never uh, in, in the Trinity had uh, heard of. He he started he broke down the Trinity into the oh let me find it the the, the scientific and the I think the biblical I think that's the words he used. Um, 
was it economic trinity yeah yeah, the, yeah, uh, the, the, uh, ontological? The economic, I, I don't think yeah. he used ontological i think he's a different word uh, well uh, no he, he might have used ontological but yeah you, you may be right i'm, I'm trying to yeah, the uh, the economic trinity and the uh, essential trinity. Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah, and essential. They, they, you know, that's what he used. Essential. As far as the uh, that those 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 terminologies, as far as my reading on the trinity, that is something new to me. So I, I mean, I it's and how he how he started laying out the he started with the, uh, the essential trinity, laying out the the trinity, and he gave some examples. So. Um, that that is um, something that you know. As far as the Trinity, uh, if 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 it had, if I had ever heard that explained, it didn't sink in. But now, <laughs> but now now it's become more aware uh, uh, of my study in the in the Trinity uh, uh, of, of our, uh, our divine supreme God. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and and the difference being who God is in His essence, which I, I like yeah. that. I mean. Uh, normally, I've heard it as as the ontological trinity, who you are in your yeah. being. Yeah, that's why I thought he used essence. that word as well, yeah. because, yeah, that's generally the way you talk about that. Yeah. Ontos, so mean, ontos mean being, yeah. Yeah, so essential trinity, I, you know, who he is in his essence. The economic, that speaks to, to the roles, the role the of the yeah. father to the son, son to the father, and then both of them toward the Holy Spirit. Yeah, and it's beautiful. I he says that those two are not contradictory. And I yeah. think, again, that's where in our culture we get into a lot of trouble with this in applying this and trying to explain this because people can't get a, a, can't get past that economic thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, um, I, I, I picked up on uh, very close to what uh, Mike did there, uh, his discussion of perichoresis. Mm. On page on page eight ninety two, you are making Camden Busey of Reformed form I know, so proud. I know, <laughs> I know. He, he he and Lane Tipton. I know. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. It just rolls off their tongue naturally, doesn't beautifully. Yeah. But he he does say on eight ninety two, uh, he says theologians refer to this mutual indwelling as the divine perichoresis, uh, Greek uh, perichoresis, uh, caresses, actually is the way it would really be said in Greek, which literally. Um, meets movement in a circle and figuratively refers to reciprocity or interpenetration. Um, and that's an interesting uh, spatial way really of, of describing it movement in a circle. Uh, mm. Like uh, again, we don't understand it temporally, but we do understand it in terms of the, the essence of God, how that they, and again, he always uses the term interpenetrate each other, but he goes on then to say an equivalent term is, circumincession and that's latin uh and in deference darcy sproul i'll say that's good and I'm, i'll move on <laughs> <laughs> he says uh which means uh in the doctrine of the trinity that the that the persons are most uh intimately united so that one always remains in the other and with the other so a marvelous way of uh in the ministry of christ in the flesh as we see him there as he says, I and the Father are one, it's a statement of perichoresis there in the sense that everything he does is what the Father is doing as well because the essence or their being uh, uh, in terms of the interpenetration of that, uh, his divine nature is in concert with the Father and the Spirit. Uh, whereas in his human nature, uh, again, as we said, it's, it's mutable. It's mm -hmm. also coming to a practical application for us, for our humanity as a second Adam of what that looks like for us, N not, not the divine second person of the Trinity, but what that actually means for him as one who trusted God and was completely faithful and obedient to every commandment and priest of God mm -hmm. and, and, and attained a righteousness. that's not our own. How does that look for us who are mutable changing creatures? Well, again, the consistency and the power of that is in the fact that the same Christ who suffered upon the cross and, uh, and, and did so in concert with his divine nature in terms of the application of that from the Father, Son, and, Son, and Spirit is absolutely consistent and an extension of that. Um, where, and I think that's where a lot of modern theologians go astray in this is they get, they get carried away with that and in terms of trying to relate it to the, to the culture uh abandon that and uh, certainly they abandon the whole idea of perichoresis and in that sense set the father against the son mm. very good very good 
Well, guys, I think this is probably a good place to sort of draw it to a close right here. And and again, just, just a word on, on this, you know, the whole subject, the doctrine of God, you know, it, it is like Marvin said, you know, when we look at our best and our highest, or was it you, Mike? Well, one of y'all said it, uh, our best and our highest knowledge of God is almost just comparable to like a yeah. child's knowledge. No, and, yeah. uh, and, you know, it, there's no way we can comprehend it. Uh, as Beaky said, we would have to be God to be able to do that. So, and so much of it is analogical. So we're having to, to really reach up and strain for just what, what we're getting. But yet, on the other hand, we can't say that we can't know anything about God. God has revealed these things to us. And, uh, and through the power of the Holy Spirit in filling us and teaching us the truth of God's word, we have to do the best to take these things, to be very balanced with these things, and to put these things together in a systematic theology right. so that we come out the other end having a correct and biblical doctrine of, of God. And so um, so I think Beaky does a good job. Uh, admittedly, for those who are listening, it is difficult. It is complicated. Uh, we're in deep waters when we're talking anything about the doctrine of God, but yet it it's not it's not supposed to just end there it's not supposed to end with just uh hard concepts hard truth to try to to get our hands around it's for us to ascertain what we can and then bring it down into our lives again by the power of the holy spirit by the grace of god so that it affects our hearts so that it affects our affections and so that we right. can love god more and glorify him more it's right. not it's not clinical theology it really right, is yeah. meant to move the heart towards praise and worship and there's the greatest analogy. Yeah. So, certainly. Amen. Amen. Well, Mike, would you mind closing this, uh, this morning, brother? Sure. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for just this time we've had this morning to <clears throat> discuss the, this, these chapters, uh, on, on just your, your, uh, your love, your, your, uh, your compassion, your, your wrath, uh, Lord, all the, the attributes, uh, of your of your immutable uh, divine nature, your, the essence, Lord and Lord, I just thank you that we can uh, just how this this book we're reading just complements and takes us back to your Word, Lord. Mm. And Lord, as we study and and discuss this, Lord, it's it's just very important to remember that you are the Creator and we are your creatures. Uh, we need to remember that, and we need to look at this as a uh, is a is learning, Lord, because we are your children, and we need to, to approach it in that aspect. But I thank you for the uh, the insights that we we discussed here, Lord. I thank you for the the the, the edification and 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 uh, the more in depth uh, discussion that we've had on the doctrine, Lord, and how how that uh, just um, helps uh, solidify uh, what we believe our and. In our in our faith, it takes us back to your truth, the the the, the uh, your word, Lord, and Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you for Van and Marvin, Lord. I thank you for those that are watching this podcast, Lord. May I just pray that this this has helped them uh, have gain a better understanding, or maybe even opened additional questions to explore, to grow in the study of of theology, and uh, to help so solidify uh, a basis of of our belief, Lord. Lord, thank you for this day, Lord, as we continue it. Bless and guide our steps. For it's in your name I pray, amen. 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 Are you amen. playing with your squeak toy down there, Michael? No, <laughs> it's, it's uh, Topaz's uh, oh, no. entry at the end, uh, playing, oh, yeah. uh, play, play, playing a, a co-starring role. Yeah, yeah, I have my I have my French doors closed uh, that are to come into my study, and I, I have curtains to block out the light and noise. They're uh, that love were left uh, that we had for Myra when she was with us, and so she Topaz was able to come in, but then the the curtains, the way of the curtains closed the doors behind her, so she can't get out. So now she's playing in here and wanting my attention since she's locked in the room with me. <laughs> okay, well, it's, yeah, for it's that. A it's a regular Again. sound we hear in our Monday prayer meeting. Yes. <laughs> and for those of you who aren't watching the video, we just saw Topaz, the, uh, I guess the, the podcast mascot jump into <laughs> yep. to Mike's lab just a, a second ago. So, uh, right. anyway, well, brothers, good being with y'all this morning. And I pray that the Lord, uh, blesses your day today and, uh, may he be glorified. Amen. Amen. All right. We'll talk to y'all later. Bye-bye.